program that I think I'm going to kind of speak to at, at this time is building capacity and community through construction trades. And so our partners here at TRU are to Kamloops as well as the Nisqanlith Band. And this is the first time they've also partnered as well. So we submitted a proposal to the Ministry of Advanced Education and we were successful in receiving um, over a million dollars into the delivery of a program that incorporates essential skills, that incorporates people that have the skills in the communities without having their recognized government credentials. How do we get them to that place? As well as additional um, training within trades training that leads to industry training authority credentials, which do happen to ladder into degree programs as well. And so this program is just rolling out right now. Um, we are looking at a target of over 80 students from each of those communities, and the programs are being delivered in community. And so um, that has demonstrated that um, to us, uh, we've delivered many programs in communities. Our greatest success is when we can at least bring the beginning of the programs into communities. And then our hopes are that those students will continue their education path here at TRU or, or wherever they choose to go. And so in the case of this program, we have significant supports built in. We have supports for elders. Uh, we have supports for ongoing tutors as well as uh, instructors. And then we're going to be incorporating cultural um, tradition and beliefs into trades training. So that's something um, that's kind of new for us as well too. Uh, so we're really excited. We're at the forefront of this program and uh, we see that over probably the last seven or eight years we've been delivering multiple programs in communities and seeing excellent success rates and seeing students coming to TRU as well as finding success within their own communities as well and help with the economic development of their own communities as well as entrepreneurship opportunities as well. So that's you know, a little bit about the program that we have going on right now, and it's over three years, so. Okay, okay. So for the past 12 years, um, um, Thompson Rivers University and School of Trades and Technology has been delivering water, um, a diploma program, a two-year diploma program in water and wastewater technology. So um, we were contacted by Indigenous Services Canada where um, they wanted um, water and wastewater operators that are operating their water systems in their First Nation communities to have the education. So um, they liked our program, they liked all the courses, they liked the fact that they want to build this technological capacity within the communities and within the systems, right? Because it's all about uh, protection of human health and protection of the environment. Um, so, um, so we have 198 First Nation communities in uh, British Columbia, and we have students coming from every one of those communities in the last 12 years, taking our education programs um, and, and training programs. And basically what we have done in order, the reason we have had success is that um, I, we have built capacity within these each individual student to um, kind of come together and provide support for their fellow students. Um, then they go on and they come together to provide support and knowledge and, um, and capacity within their communities. So I, all I am doing and our school is doing is delivering the education. And then we're building this capacity and this knowledge base and this technical knowledge with them that they can do this and then do things for themselves. So I, I've just created a fit. Everything else is done by, by them. And that is just the best. <laughs> and it's, so when we first came in, uh, most of the operate so there's a uh, industry certification so most of the water operators were small water system operators because of our program 
and I don't I can't I don't have data on it but because of our, our programs um, now we have operators that go up to the highest level which is level four um, and because of our program um, the operators came together and formed this association called First Nation Operators Water Network um, and they um, therefore advocate for water systems, they advocate for community, they advocate for human health, protection of the environment, um, as well as their living conditions, their water system conditions, wages, everything. It's, it's a huge advocacy um, organization that has arose. And most of the people that started it is our graduates from the program. So it has had like a huge benefit. And then the other day um, we were told um, so we have had three intakes of these students. So we deliver the diploma program on a part-time basis. At a four, it takes four years to complete the diploma because um, these individuals, our students, are also operators in their community. So they come on a part-time basis and finish the diploma in four years. And then we were just recently asked to look at uh, doing another intake. So that would take us to six working with these communities for 16, 16 years. It's called water and wastewater technology. Okay. And because of that, you, the communities end up with water that is, can be used. Uh, no. So what happens is that the money for the infrastructure or the system development is provided by Indian Northern Affairs or Indigenous Services Canada. Yeah. And we provide the training for the operators to run those systems effectively. Okay. And then, because there's a lot of boil water issues, most of the boil water issues are in the communities because the water is not safe to drink because of the microbiological hazards. So right now in British Columbia, there are 200, I don't have my data with me, about 200 and so water systems and there are only 39 bowl water advisories. And I can't say that's because of our program, but it's slowly we're part of that reduction uh, strategy. And then in non-First Nation systems, we have 4,800 small water systems where about 600 on bowl water advisory, right? So First Nation communities are doing excellent work on getting their bowl water notice notice is reduced and the training and the education is all part of this this huge strategy right so and that wonder just reminded me of something as well with this program and, and, and the building of capacity and community through construction trades and the premise of that program was so first nations communities could build their own housing and so that's key. We're seeing, um, you know, the greatest growth uh, within the Indigenous communities uh, here in the, in the area. And they need to be able to address uh, their own housing issues. And lack of funding has caused uh, people living in squalor. And they've been taken advantage of by some construction companies. And this way it puts the power back into their hands again to be able to address their own needs within community, as well as entrepreneurship opportunities. So maybe a comment before I maybe describe uh, my um, take on that. Uh, and that is that um, too often, we provide the infrastructure or that investment to think that we've solved the problem. But we haven't solved the problem because there's no way to operate, no way trained to operate that equipment. So it's not to unlike uh, a technology solution comes into the institution, but nobody can use the technology until they're trained, and then that's an ongoing process to do that. So here we're building capacity in terms of operators to be able to operate the equipment and keep it safe, keep it maintained, and so on. The part that I wanted to focus on was uh, what I'm approached on is not a specific program, but an array of our trades programs by the industry in our area. The industry have uh, resource sharing agreements with the First Nations, and under those agreements, there is a requirement for the diversification of their workforce. And so they wish to diversify their workforce to have more indigenous uh, peoples and, and more women indigenous people in their industries. And um, 
uh, and they don't. They don't have the skills to be able to do even some of the entry level uh, positions to do that. So we are putting on, for example, programs, uh, women in trades and technology start getting them started in terms of the trades area uh, uh, to be able to make an inroad into some of those companies. Now, when they do programs like that and others like heavy equipment operators, uh, operator, these are short programs that a lot of the community and youth that have got the motivation that want to succeed, they can do that. These are weeks in terms of programs. They get results within a few months, not that you do something that is a uh, you know, much longer educational journey before you get there. And so the good thing about being employed in those industries is that when a, an individual gets in, then they get indentured as something called an apprentice. And then when they become an apprentice, they can become a carpenter or many of the trades and become what's called Red Seal certified, where they can now work anywhere across Canada, across all the jurisdictions and take their, their uh, uh, credential with them. And then further, as uh, um, Heather indicated earlier, we actually have a, uh, a degree here called the um, uh, Bachelor's in uh, Trades and Technology Leadership. And so they get two years credit with that uh, trades qualification towards that four-year degree. So it is about, I think, working some of the programs that are shorter in duration but skilled in terms of equipment operations and so on, and getting people started in the industries. The industries need those people in, in order to uh, fulfill their uh, resource sharing agreements, so it's a win-win situation. And furthermore, of course, is there is the community building as well in terms of the prosperity for the indigenous communities uh, as well. So. It's a broader thing, it's a broader kind of initiative. It applies to many of the trades uh, programs. It's not like a cohort of indigenous learners in just one area. And by doing what we're doing, we're basically helping multiple stakeholders uh, you know, achieve their success and their aims. And you know how we were talking about learning being both ways? So um, in indigenous communities, they have a, a, a model. Um, so what we have done when we create that center of excellence for BC small water system, we are adapting that model to help other small water systems in British Columbia that are non-indigenous. Mm -hmm. So that's, and, and we, are, uh, we are working and we're in the progress of doing that right now. So. Well, data, of course. Um, uh, completion rates, exam results, those are, you know, the obvious ones. The ones that I think that get overlooked quite often, um, maybe a student didn't complete at that time, but then they came back and they continued on with their education. Uh, I think our vision for um, success sometimes is, is quite short term. Uh, we need to look a little bit farther out to see what the impact of their experience and their education actually had on their lives and maybe those around them. So it's that ripple out effect, you know, that we speak about so often. And it's all about systems as well, too, that small change, that lever here. Where did it affect? Who else did it affect? Did it affect children? Did it affect parents, other community members? Um, in many of our programs that um, are Indigenous uh, focused or specific, um, and women in trades, we bring in others that have walked before them. And um, that's when we hear about the true stories about success. And so I think that narrative is, is very, very, uh, very important. Um, and when we start measuring success, we need to start incorporating that qualitative, you know, um, data as well as the quantitative. To students going into trades and technology education, when they're asked why are you here and what's your success, they're here for the number one re reason they're here is is that they're um, after a career uh, and career success in their field. So when an individual becomes employed, that's success for us. There's success in other ways that we can measure as well, but if I take the biggest overarching kind of success factor, that's it. And when I take that further to the indigenous communities, I mentioned earlier that in those resource sharing agreements, it's about the 
those industries, being able to get the right people. It's about having the right people in the right jobs at the right time. Is is, is that uh, and so success for me is when somebody says I came to your program, I succeeded in the program, and I'm now employed. I'm personally satisfied in my career and and the fact that they have the opportunity to continue to advance their their career, uh, their life journey um, through their career. So since we have social scientists in this, uh, this room, um, um, definitely quantitative data, which is so easy to do. But the qualitative data, it's, it tells incredible stories. Yes. Incredible, incredible stories. If we could sit here all day and talk about them, mm -hmm. and they'll make you cry. <laughs> so we have reports that we have to send to the Ministry of Advanced Education on our programs you know, that includes both the qualitative and the quantitative data, and um, some of the fr the framework of the program, et cetera, where the successes were, and I'd be happy to share those as well. Yeah. Great. Because remember, we collected a lot of the narratives for the mining program. Yeah, and yeah. I have to do it for all of my reporting, for all the funds I get from the Ministry of Advanced Ed, so.